bear with me one moment. All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm Miriam Green. I'm the Director of Marketing and Alumni Affairs at American Friends of the Hebrew University. Again, thank you for joining us for today's Alumni Association event. Uh, for those who are joining us for the first time, um, we seek to connect and engage Hebrew University alumni around the country um, by doing events like this and, and more. Um, so we're very happy to have you um, and, uh, Hebrew University friends joining us today. Um, we've been doing these sorts of events even before the pandemic and we will continue to do so as a way to continue to bring our alumni community together. There are many ways you can get involved with us from participating in future events, sharing your alumni story and photos, letting us know if you have job openings to put on our alumni job board and giving to the alumni annual fund, which supports scholarship Hebrew University students. So to learn more, please email alumni at afhu.org. Today is our last porch talk of the spring lineup, uh, but we will resume in the fall. Um, the good news is there'll be plenty of great digital events and content coming from American friends and the Hebrew community in between. So to learn more about upcoming events, please visit afhu.org slash event. Uh, today, everyone will be on mute during the presentation, but we will be taking questions at the end. To submit a question, please type it in the chat box and we'll do our best to as many as we can. I'm now pleased to introduce our very distinguished speaker today, Professor Aaron Trowin from Hebrew University's Robert H. Smith Faculty of Agriculture, Food, and Environment. His laboratory at the Institute of Biochemistry takes an interdisciplinary approach to understanding the role of risk factors for conditions ranging from Alzheimer's to B vitamin, folic acid, and iodine deficiency. As he has said, we want to identify likely causes of cognitive impairment. We create preclinical models and explore which nutritional intervention, interventions can improve behavioral, psychological, and neurochemical outcomes. If we can enhance vascular health in the brain, we stand a better chance of preventing stroke, and I'm going to try this one, zero vascular disease and dementia. Professor Trone has also been examining the effects of liver health on brain function. Um, yeah, you know, liver health and brain function. In collaboration with HU colleagues, Professor Trone is exploring the health benefits of functional food and creating fortified produce. We developed a new strain of passion fruit with neuroprotective properties, he explains. Functional food has biological and health properties that go beyond nourishing the body and supplying energy. They try to understand the, met the metabolic and nutritional basis of disease and to see how they can prevent illness through metabolic metabolic foods, botanicals, and nutri nutrition. Professor Trone has been actively involved in public health and nutritional policy in Israel, serving on government research committees aiming at addressing hunger and child malnutrition. As he says, no child should go hungry. Hebrew University is one of Israel's leading centers for nutrition, and we take this problem of food insecurity very seriously. He is a graduate of the Hebrew University with a doctorate from Oxford. Very impressive, no surprise. Um, and he's devoted his career to maximizing human health. He's internationally recognized and has been a visiting scientist with the Neuroscience Aging Laboratory of Gene Mayer USDA Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging at Tufts University. Professor Trone has received the Alzheimer's Association Ronald and Nancy Ray New Investigative Research Award, among other honors. Professor, take it away. Thank you, Miriam, for that very kind introduction. Um, makes me blush a little bit. And also it's good that you spoke of all of those things I've done in neuroscience and nutrition because I'm not gonna be talking about them today. In fact, uh, you know, we all have the experience of the uh, BC period before Corona and uh, the current uh, period that we're in. And the past year has been marked by almost a single-minded um, focus on public health and nutrition policy issues. Um, and what I thought I would do today, uh, given this uh, growing experience in the uh, public health and nutrition world, 
Um, I'm at a bit of a crossroads and I'm, I'm going to share with you some uh, remarks, a kind of informal uh, fireside chat um, to give ex ex examples of the types of tensions that exist when scientists uh, try to provide evidence for policy issues. And I'll give you examples from three issues that we're dealing with here in Israel that I think will resonate uh, with you um, and you will be familiar with from the United States. Um, this is just a, an opening cartoon. You're all familiar with the message, random medical news. Every day you open the newspaper, you're going to find some sensational report about a new cure, new research that's uh, uh, provided a cure for some malady or another. And that, that's really wonderful. That's what we try to do in university research departments is attack uh, human problems. Um, so if you spin the dial here, you may find that coffee will have an effect on depression in twins, um, according to a report released today. Now this may mock the scientists and it may mock the uh, media, both of whom can be part of this sensationalism. Um, but whether or not it's a result of the hype of results by the scientists or the media, it really has to do with a misunderstanding of the process by which we generate knowledge which is slow and incremental and cumulative. Um, it's not something where you have a single definitive study that changes and revolutionizes uh, uh, science and policy and practice, creates a paradigm shift, but rather we look at a long-term accumulation of often conflicting, limited and uncertain data. Nowhere is this more true than in nutrition science possibly because the basis for much of what we see in the media reports and the basis for much of what we use in practice um, are observational data. They're observations of the connection between patterns of nutrition and health. And um, just for one small example, um, you may be familiar with the French paradox. French paradox says that the French consume delicious, wonderful food, rich cholesterol, fatty, rich cheeses, um, creamy sauces and the like, and yet they don't suffer from the same rates of heart disease that uh, Americans suffer from. So you have on the one hand a dietary pattern and on the other hand a health pattern. And what we try to do is look at correlations, but as we all know, correlation is not causation. In the United States, for example, we have 2.6 times the rates of death from heart disease. Wine consumption is much higher in, in France. So Americans drink 2.8 liters per capita less than the French do. Maybe wine is protected. By drawing this kind of correlation, you could say, oh, if we only drink wine, we'll be protected. On the other hand, obesity is much higher in the United States. And if you look at the portion sizes in the US, so are the serving sizes. They're up to a third higher on average than what an average portion would be in a French restaurant or in a typical French diet. So what's the cause and effect here? Or are these merely correlations? Now we're interested in understanding these connections because if we can understand the connection and the connection is causal, that is to say, if the reduced heart disease in France, despite the high intake of fat and cholesterol is a result of drinking wine, then we can have our cheese and our heart health too. All we need to do is drink more wine. Now, wouldn't that be nice? But you actually have to prove that in a clinical trial, and clinical trials in nutrition are notoriously difficult. In fact, generally nutrition research is notoriously difficult, and we're at a state in the field where there's been a tremendous amount of criticism of the types of nutritional epidemiology which provide the basis for hypotheses about how we might modify our diets and thereby modify our health. This is a paper by John Ioannidis out of Stanford um, he's a wonderful biostatistician, and he's looked at the literature on epidemiology. First, he started out in genetics and the relation of genetic mutations and disease and criticized the field of genetics. He moved on to nutrition epidemiology, saying, for example, <clears throat> much of the public often consider epidemiologic associations of nutritional factors to represent causal effects that can inform public health policy and guidelines. Assuming that the evidence from cohort studies represents lifespan long causal associations for a baseline life expectancy of 80 years, 
non-experts presented only with relative risks may falsely infer that eating 12 hazelnuts a day would prolong life by 12 years, that is one year per hazelnut, or conversely, that consuming one egg daily would reduce life expectancy by six years. Could these results possibly be true? Now, leaving aside the jargon, you get the idea. He's really making fun of the field in order to make a serious point. What he calls for are randomized clinical trials. Now, imagine you have an association between egg eating and nut eating and heart health. You'd have to put people on these diets throughout their lives and have one group randomized to eat eggs and the other group randomized to not eating eggs in order to see if that made a difference ultimately in their life expectancy. And you'd have to do that throughout the whole lifespan. That's clearly not going to be feasible. And in fact, the people he's criticizing who run the Physician's Health Study and the Nurse's Health Study at Harvard um, refuted this view saying the idea is infeasible and unlikely to advance nutritional science or improve policies if we're trying to create a perfect world and perfect certainty that may be true. And the idea of randomized clinical trials may be necessary if we're going to try a new drug which has risks and benefits. But with food, there's probably relatively little downside. It's not like we're eating pure poison, even if overconsumption of some foods may be toxic. And we can't regulate it in the same way of drugs and everyone is exposed to food. So there is no kind of condition that you'd have in a drug trial where one group are not exposed at all and the other group are given something that was developed in a laboratory and only they have access to it if they're randomized to the treatment arm. So in a sense, this idea that we have safety measured first, just like we did with coronavirus vaccine and effect efficacy on the other hand, um, may not be the right model for nutrition research. Now, what really got me interested in this from the neuroscience perspective is if we believe my hardcore basic science research to be true, and let's say we want to recommend to people to eat passion fruit or in the United States, it might be blueberries, a cup of blueberries a day. In Israel, that would cost me nearly $10 a day. Multiply that by a year, $3,600. That's not something which is easy and accessible for most people. On the left-hand side, you can see what we'd recommend people um, should eat healthy fruits and vegetables based diet and eat them socially with good uh, health and relaxation. On the right hand side, you see people are recipients of Meals on Wheels. Those people are not going to get the optimal diet that we might want to recommend based on our laboratory science and they're not going to get that diet because of circumstances. It's not merely an issue of recommending lifestyle choices, eat a healthy diet, but rather we have to make sure that there's health equity throughout our society and that people have the option to consume the foods that we want. And that really pushes us in the realm of policy. Now, just last week, the American Society for Nutrition, which is the world's largest uh, nutrition science society, um, had a very interesting webinar about the relation between science and policy. And they posed this kind of rational model of evidence-based evidence policy that a policy problem requiring action is identified and goals and values and objectives are clearly set forth. All significant ways of addressing the problem and achieving the goals are enumerated. The consequences of each alternative are predicted. The consequences are then compared with goals and objectives and a strategy is selected in which the consequences most closely match the goals and objectives. In other words, if you follow this algorithm, you're going to achieve the best possible outcome on the basis of the best possible information we might have today. Uh, we all know in the policy world, things don't really work that way. Now, what is the role of science in a rational world? Of course, we want to identify problems. And I should say, this is science and scientists. Scientists are people who have their complicated mix of agendas and interests and idiosyncrasies and outlooks. Um, so that may be different than this process, which is hopefully rational and objective and protects us from our individual biases. But the science as a term um, is supposed to identify the problems. It's supposed to measure the magnitude of the problem and how serious it is. You review the policy alternatives and then systematically assess the consequences of any particular policy. And then ultimately after a policy is enacted, you wanna be able to evaluate what in fact results from the policy. That's called formative research, steps which create 
the database for designing a policy and evaluative research, the type of research that looks at whether or not the policy was successful. And that can be seen in a life cycle so that the science is really part of a cycle where you monitor health, you diagnose and you investigate, you assess the situation, you provide the information by informing and educating policymakers, maybe you empower them, maybe you empower their constituents. And then there's some kind of magic process where the legislation and the policymakers, decision makers take that information and turn it into the sausage of policy. And finally, you want to be able to evaluate this and make sure that the outcomes have improved and that you haven't created any undue side effects. Just to give you an idea, that process means that we are never certain at a given point in time of our science. We are never certain that the policy is going to be optimal. And in fact, there's an interaction between science and policy that is evolutionary. On the left-hand side of this slide, you'll see a, um, a, a, a the, one of the first USDA uh, diet and nutrition recommendations from around World War II, there were seven food groups. One of them included um, milk and dairy, and in milk and dairy, they recommended having butter and ice cream. Now, you'd never have that recommendation today, but you have to remember the context was in a nation that had suffered the Great Depression, in a nation that was having difficulty finding recruits for the armed forces, the effort of World War II, because Many recruits were not eligible on health grounds. They were malnourished um, and they needed to be fattened up. And it was at a time when there were single nutrition, single nutrient deficiency diseases, uh, pellagra, goiter, and so on and so forth, uh, rickets, diseases that were caused by a single micronutrient. Um, or lack of a single micronutrient. And that, that was coincided with the growth of biochemistry, nutrition science, and the identification of vitamins and micronutrients and the understanding that deficiencies of single ingredients could cause a whole clinical phenomenon. Fast forward to the 50s and 60s, you begin to focus on nourishment. What happens when you have heart disease? And is heart disease caused by fat or by sugar? And a whole debate over the components, the macro components of diet. Um, and food pyramids were devised to try to improve upon the original plate. By the Obama administration, you go back to choosemyplate.gov, a better representation to try to guide individual um, choices. And we're looking now at dietary patterns, not at individual foods, but you want fruits and grains and protein and vegetables and the appropriate balance on your plate. Now, these recommendations still have serious policy implications and influence. They're registered through the Farm Bill. They have to do with support of dairy or support of um, uh, the meat industry and lobbies are involved in this mix of generating a government report on the basis of scientific panels that come together to give the best available diet. So we've gone from single deficiency diseases and single nutrients to looking at macronutrients and chronic disease to overall dietary patterns like the Mediterranean diet. And now in this day and age, we're already talking about food systems. Food systems are much more complicated. You know, we tend to think about diet, about the individual diet, the level on the right-hand side of what it is that you actually eat and how that affects your health. But our diets are determined by our behaviors and those consumer behaviors really have to do with what food is available to you when you walk into a supermarket. Now, some of that has to do with the supermarkets. Some of that has to do with what food is manufactured and put on the shelves and how it's put on the shelves. And if you live near a Whole Foods or if you live in a food desert far away where the only thing that you see for food is a 7-Eleven, your choice of fruits and vegetables and healthful foods, processed foods is going to be very different. And of course, your ability to purchase what's on the shelf will depend on your income. So there are economic and cognitive and aspirational and situational factors. There are only 20 people who signed up for this webinar. I assume most of you thought, hmm, food fights food. That's interesting. I'm interested in nutrition. We may have a biased subsample of the population here. There are those who really don't care and who may make very different food choices without knowing anything about you individually. If I had time and we were in a classroom, of course, we could have a show of hands about some of the questions that are going to emerge. So in other words, you have to think in a food system about the food environment. What is the availability of food? What is the affordability of food? What kinds of products are made available? Are they processed? Are they fresh? 
And then you have to think about how food is produced and brought to the consumer along the whole food supply chain. And that includes global trade issues. It includes climate change and concerns about how we produce food and what's available and, and so on. In other words, we have to think about availability, about access and about utilization. And most of our controversies in that first slide are really focused on utilization, how people individually work with food. What I'm interested in and become interested in is really the policy dimension. Now we know that knowledge does not equal behavior and that evidence similarly doesn't equal policy. Knowledge and behavior would be, I know I should diet and yet I gain a couple of pounds during this COVID year by sitting too closely at my desk during restrictions and overeating. I teach this stuff, I know I should know better. But behavior is driven by a whole variety of factors which aren't only knowledge-based, not even aspirational-based. Evidence and policy similarly don't translate directly. We, the fact that we know that smoking is bad for you doesn't mean that we've eradicated smoking, which is a major source of heart disease. The fact that we know that obesity kills us is also not translated yet into clear policies to reduce the epidemic of obesity we have. So I'm gonna give you some, in the time we have left, uh, some examples of research that we're involved on, on food fortification policy, on anti-obesity legislation and on food security. Um, very, very quickly, um, since I assume this is largely a United States audience, you're all familiar with uh, iodized salt, Morton salt, when it rains, it pours. We put iodine in the salt to prevent goiter. United States, until salt iodization, uh, had a major goiter belt, areas which just ecologically didn't have enough iodine in the food supply. And people, whether they had a so-called healthy diet or not, simply wouldn't have enough of this mineral in their diet to provide for thyroid function. Um, and thyroid function is essential for metabolism and growth and cognitive development. Now, the simple solution is to add a little bit of iodine. You're talking about one part per billion or one part per million in salt. It costs pennies to iodize a ton of salt. You don't recognize the difference in taste or sensory um, capacity. It doesn't change anything. And so by putting this, adding this iodine into the food supply, you change the health of the population without having to change anything in their behavior at a tremendously cost-effective um, value. If you look at the cost to iodize people with vaccines, um, it would cost $45 per fully immunized child. The ratio of um, cost to benefit is 16 to one. It's a very effective policy. We know how important vaccines are these days, but food fortification has a 27 to one benefit in producing in reducing disease and disability. So it's an incredibly effective um, health intervention, public health intervention. It's been around for over 100 years, 132 countries in the world iodize their salt in Israel, we don't. And in fact, until 2016, when I, with colleagues, ran the first national iodine survey in Israel, um, we didn't even know that we had a problem. Well, it turns out that because of this simple survey, Israel ranks in the lowest, we found that Israel ranks in the lowest decile of iodine intake globally. Uh, pregnant women in Israel lack iodine. And in fact, you can calculate that that would cause a loss of a billion shekel per year in health costs and loss of GDP due to poor cognitive development of the children of affected mothers. This is a huge issue, simple to solve with known technology and best public health practice. So the government recommended adding supplements, um, adding iodine to uh, prenatal supplements and recommended that people buy iodized salt. But up until then, only 3% of the salt sold in Israeli supermarkets was iodized. So the Israeli, one of the big Israeli salt producers created a new product, iodized salt. And they write in the back that iodine is a central mineral for healthy and bodily function at all life stages. Iodine enriched sea salt has exactly the same beloved and familiar favor recommended for the entire family. And the Ministry of Health recommends enriching salt with 30 milligrams of iodine per kilogram of salt. There's no mention that encouraging salt consumption is actually bad for you because you increase sodium intake and you cause stroke and heart disease. So in effect, this new information and a voluntary program to increase awareness had the opportunity to maybe improve, potentially improve um, thyroid health, but actually harm public health in other ways. Now, we have certain price controls on certain basic staples, salt being one of them, a kilo of salt gets sold for two shekels. 
um, the iodized salt gets sold for far more. So in fact, it's much more expensive. And this advertising allows the marketing of a more expensive uh, version of salt, which means you're going to increase health disparities. So unregulated vo voluntary salt iodization may promote health disparities. And what we really need to do is have the government legislate. Every salt sold, all salt sold in Israel for human consumption should have iodine in it. It would be simple, it's technologically feasible, but there are a whole variety of barriers. There are technical concerns because you have to work with industry and someone has to pay the price of putting in the machinery. Industry wants to be indemnified in case there are class action suits because some people say, you've poisoned me with iodine. Um, there are public health concerns, just like with vaccinations. Iodine, we know we put it on sores to disinfect um, sores. So as a disinfectant, it's toxic. So people say, well, we don't want to put iodine in our food. How should the government put in our food, uh, put poison in our food? Um, there's public mistrust of science. There are regulatory and trade concerns. What happens if we have a law that all salt has to be iodized? Does that create a trade barrier to importing salt? And are we allowed to do that in terms of World Trade Organization requirements and so on? And who's going to pay for the next monitoring survey? We want to make sure that there's quality control, that they actually don't put too much iodine in the salt, which could cause other problems. So in order to make this happen safely, if we legislate, someone has to pay the price for doing the next survey, showing that the policy worked and was effective, and on the other hand, that we haven't caused harms. That's a tall order for a government uh, agency which has legal responsibility for the population. So if I look at where we are in Israel now, we're moving towards this legislation. We've just done a small survey which shows that in the past five years since our original survey, nothing has changed in terms of the population's um, uh, iodine concentration. So the voluntary measures have not been effective and we really de do need to move with legislation. Um, and we have data that can't be ignored anymore. Well, it can't be ignored because it's out there but it can be downplayed and diminished and told, well, we think it's important, but it's not a priority right now, or we think it's important, but there are barriers to legislation and we'll just leave it voluntary. That's easier, of course, for the government. So in order to do this and make a move, scientists who understand what they believe to be true need to be involved in the process and somehow push for change. Or do we just say, no, I sit in the ivory power. All I do is I present you with the data. You're the decision maker. You and the Ministry of Health have to make up your minds. I'm not going to get involved. And it's tricky. We have to educate ourselves. That's part of our role in the university. But we also have to educate others. We have to educate decision makers. We have to discuss the evidence and see whether or not this really is important or not. At some point that may shift into advocacy, which means I have my preferred policy agenda and I wanna see that that goes through regardless of any other alternatives. That's not where you wanna see objective unbiased science that we can have confidence in that won't drive policy and, and drive a, a political agenda. I don't need to give you more examples from COVID. We've all seen these issues arise but it requires collaboration and it requires leadership from universities. And one of the things that we can do is convene people to bring them together. And this is just an example. Um, if you go back to the recording of this talk, you'll find the uh, uh, website where we put on a conference with the Ministry of Health in order to give this panel of Ministry of Health officials the opportunity to say, we believe this is important and to share that information with the general public in order to create this kind of coalition. The next example is the obesity epidemic. This is the classic slide of the rates of obesity in the United States. This is now true around the world. 1985, very low levels of obesity ranging from zero to less than 10%. By 2014, over a third of the population of the United States is obese. This has tremendous health impacts. And in Israel alone, where we lead the world, among the leading countries in the world, in terms of sugar consumption and the growing rates of obesity, believe it or not, we spend an estimated six to nine billion shekel a year on the attended health costs of obesity. That would be um, nearly 1% of our GDP. Similar numbers in the US, of course, the multiples on a larger on a larger population are higher. Now, if you think of the money that we've spent on COVID and Corona and on relief, um, we'll see some of that in food security. Now, what are we doing with our resources if we could prevent that, if we could find the causes and we could prevent that through policy? 
One of the ways to do this, if we think that people's personal choice and autonomy are important, and we want to provide people with information and hope that they can act on that information to reduce their health risks, we need to label food. And in the US, you know, you have the labeling on the back of your package and it has the, um, what do they call it, uh, nutrition facts. Um, and it'll tell you how much salt and sodium and fat and so on are in the, in the um, uh, product. Um, that takes a lot of information and knowledge and education in order to be able to make reasonable judgments and put your shopping cart full of the food that will add up to a healthy diet. Um, as a result, people have been experimenting with front of package labeling and several countries have put on warning labels like you would have on cigarettes saying, this is not recommended for your health, put a warning label on the food on the front so that regardless of what's behind it, what um, food it is and what um, uh, uh, the aspiration, what, what we want the food for, um, you'd have a, a warning that presents you with information with three categories of food, um, high in sugar content, high in sodium or salt content, and high in saturated fats, all of which are known to contribute in when consumed in excess to um, uh, metabolic disease. And by doing this, uh, countries around the world have shown that you can both modify consumer behavior to a certain degree. But what's more important is companies, food companies, the foods of companies that make our processed food supply. Remember the food environment. That food supply with processed food, cheap, nutrient poor, energy dense, salt dense, sugar dense, fat dense foods. That food supply is designed to make us overconsume food because we want to sell the food. That's how you make a profit. And so the red labels are designed to counteract that. And in Israel, that's been done in Chile and been done in Mexico, Israel adopted that. But because the food industry said, we don't want to only um, have warning labels, you can't just penalize us for making food, give us something in return, the Ministry of Health said, okay, we'll give you a green label. The green label will be put on foods that are healthful. And so there was a way of trying, the industry opposes the red labels, but they're very happy for the green label. And overall, this policy reform was a major drive and a major legislative drive by the uh, former uh, Minister of Health, Jakob Litzman. And it started in around 2015, 2016, 2017, there was legislation. It was supposed to be enacted in immediately and due to immense pressure from industry it was delayed until the beginning of 2020. With an extra phase a year later, where there would be an inc a, a, a label placed on foods which had um, even lower levels of salt, sugar, and um, fat. And the industry's claim was we need time in order to reformulate our products. We need time in order to cut these ingredients out and still have a market because people won't eat it if it isn't um, what they're used to. I'm just going to show you a little ad that the uh, Ministry of Health produced. Oops, sorry. Let me see if I can get this to play. And it's just a minute long, it's in Hebrew, but you'll get the idea. Um, um, the children appear to the mother on these labeled products and they're educating the mother about what not to eat. Let me see if I can get this to work now. What are you doing there? Miss? What are you doing, mom? Are you going to eat something that the Ministry of Health labeled? We got too much sugar in this. So they've showed us sugar, salt, and fat. Not healthy. Wait, this is labeled too, so I should put this back too. Don't be silly. This is the green label. This is recommended. Green stop, sorry, red stop, green, go forward. The Ministry of Health is making orders. So I hope that was clear. The industry response has been interesting. So they have done some reformulation, as you can see here with the pretzels on the left-hand side. There are green pretzels with a big green V that don't have salt. And there are your regular pretzels that do have salt. Now people have a choice, so that's a good idea. In the middle, you see cottage cheese, which is kind of an Israeli staple food, or used to be in any case. 
And on the left hand side, you see 9% fat cottage cheese, which has a red label. It's hard to see here on the side. But the 9% fat and the label on the food is green, indicating, well, that must be healthy. On the right hand side, you see the healthy 1% fat, low fat version of cottage cheese, which doesn't have a red label, but note that the red, <laughs> that the 1% is labeled in red. In other words, the industry is very clever about creating competing signals. And you can see that on Ben and Jerry's right next to the red label saying there's high sugar. There's a little blue label that says it's made with all natural milk. So if you were a consumer and you had to pay attention to the price and the brand and the product and everything else on this, you might have your attention distracted from the warning label. And we don't know whether there's a signal of virtue and causing of harm by creating these new packages on the food. That ad that I showed you, which was very clever and sweet, how many people do you think have seen it? Well, the nutrition scientists have seen it because you can find it online. It was broadcast for about a day until the industry pressure made the uh, Ministry of Health withdraw it from uh, the media. The Ministry of Health's budget for advertising is roughly 70,000 shekel a year. The advertising industry, that was at least in 2017. The industry's advertising budget for snacks, health, unhealthy snacks for children is 690 million shekel. So by comparison, there's no competition. We don't really have the clout to make a difference. And what we really wanna find out is on the basis of evidence, is this policy, on which huge political capital was spent, is it going to be effective so that it'll be sustainable in the face of pressure from industry? I'm not saying that industry is evil. Industry are trying to produce good, tasty, cheap food. Most consumers consume most of the, con are concerned first with taste, then with price, and only later with health. I mean, let's face it, if you're buying Ben and Jerry's, you're not doing that in order to go on a diet. So what we're going to be doing next, and we don't have data yet, but we've just been awarded a grant, is to use eye tracking technology in order to be able to measure what the consumer sees on the product, whether or not they actually register that consciously, and whether or not that affects their declared preferences for healthy food and their actions of what they put in the basket. I'm doing this with a colleague in, uh, in um, behavioral economics and psychology. And we'll be able to see after this something very important about how we can design the policy in order to make it more effective in addition to seeing whether or not it works. Just to give you an idea of what the technology looks like, we have a small demonstration. So we hope to be able to do some um, groundbreaking work. This has only been done a few times before um, and provide real objective information on how people behave in a real setting, not when they're telling what they think or what they believe or what they prefer on a questionnaire, but actually how they behave in the supermarket in order to see how we can guide policy in the future. Now that brings me to food security. If you look at an American supermarket, there giant. There's an enormous availability of food, and it's very hard to imagine that anyone could be hungry with such an abundance. And yet COVID gave us for the first time some indication that our food supply isn't guaranteed. We all experienced empty shelves. This was due to the disruption of supply and demand, not necessarily due to overconsumption and panic buying. It wasn't necessarily that food was 
overall um, in, in uh, scarcity, but it could have been. And there were certain parts of the food supply chain which were actually impacted adversely by uh, COVID, for example, meat packing uh, industry, where there were outbreaks of the disease and where meat, became, meat products became uh, scarce. Still, this isn't usual. And the lines of bread lines of people who, for the first time, were experiencing hunger because they're, they became unemployed due to the pandemic um, were really quite shocking. There's a growth of hundreds of percents in the Western world in rich countries of need for food and difficulty for people putting food on their table. And that doesn't mean that there hasn't been food scarcity before, but oftentimes we don't see it, we don't notice it. It's hard to tell what hunger really looks like. And when we talk about hunger, the language is very emotive and very morally compelling and yet very vague scientifically. We could talk about malnourishment, simply not having adequate nutrition without necessarily having a lack of food or calories. That's sometimes called hidden hunger, like those micronutrient deficiencies I spoke about. There's also famine and starvation, which are very extreme. And obviously in famine and, and um, starvation, um, we need to act. Um, but what is food security and food insecurity? What is that word that we tend to use now when we try to deal with policy? So when I teach this in a food policy course, I often ask people questions. Like I do a poll and for, for lack of time, we're not gonna do that here, but you can ask people whether or not they believe that food is a basic human right. Do you agree or disagree with the statement that access to ample, affordable, nutritious food is a basic human right? Or do you agree that poverty is inevitable? Some people are always going to struggle with it and they can't all be helped. Do you believe that it's the government's responsibility to ensure that no one goes hungry? What is it no one? Do we want zero hunger? What's an acceptable level of hunger in our society? Maybe it's not the government's job. Maybe it's individuals or public civic organizations, churches, synagogues and the like should make sure that people don't go hungry. Maybe it's just a technical issue. We waste about a third of our food. Of all the food that we produce, a third goes into the trash. It's an enormous waste of resources and it has huge environmental impact as well. So maybe food insecurity and hunger are understood, best understood as a problem of inefficient and inequitable distribution. Now we all know the old saw, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. I'd only say on that, maybe it, that's a false dichotomy. Maybe you can do both, but those are policy issues. There are a lot of people who think that welfare costs too much and encourages poverty. In other words, even if we think that we should provide aid to people, if we provide food stamps, maybe that's going to encourage people to be lazy and shiftless and it'll increase the problem rather than solve it. So the issue isn't, should we solve it morally, but rather, how should we do so? Um, there are issues of corruption, there are issues of looking at people who make bad choices and blaming the victims. Sometimes that may be true. And there's debate over whether or not we need food banks um, to do good or whether the food banks do harm. I'll come to that a little bit in a moment in Israel. If I have five more minutes, Miriam, is that okay? Yes. Okay. Um, looking at, uh, at uh, the Reagan era, this is a, a, a historical debate um, Regan got into hot water because his administration talked about the fact that um, there was no hunger. It's just people not knowing where or how to get this help. And in the middle here, this is from the LA Times and uh, in the New York Times, you see two graphs on the top, people living at the po poverty level and on the bottom, people receiving food stamps. And you can say that it's simply a matter of poverty. And so poverty policy is more important than nutrition policy. That may be one way of looking at it, but the hunger issue was really the um, a sore point. People don't like to hear that there's hunger. And we have a similar debate in Israel um, just this year, the beginning of the COVID uh, um, event, Sahi Anegbi said, the non it's nonsense that people have nothing to eat. It's really rubbish. Um, a Victor Kaplan I just spoke to right before the election. He's the director general of the Ministry of Labor, Welfare and Social Services. And he unequivocally said, there is hunger in Israel. Anyone who denies this is in denial. Um, and he also blamed it on the government, it's the finance ministry. I said, well, you're the government. What are you doing about it? 
The Ministry of Welfare, of course, was run by Itzik Shmuley, who was from the Labour Party. And instead of providing the money to the Ministry of Welfare, which had programs, pilot programs, to feed 11,000 Israelis out of the estimated 200,000 who, based on economic uh, criteria, were food insecure, um, the uh, money went to Aryeh Dere from Shas in the Ministry of Interior to distribute food stamps. So there are political barriers as well. Um, and I was a member of the research subcommittee of the National Nutritional Security Council headed by the late uh, Professor Dov Chernachowski. And I lobbied him to try to do a survey to identify those Israelis, not only the ones who are known to the welfare who are already poor and receiving benefits or are identifiable as vulnerable and in need of potentially in need of aid during this difficult period, but also the people who have come on hard times. A fifth of Israeli small businesses folded during Corona, right? We had unemployment levels of up to a million people, which is a quarter of the workforce. It's had tremendous economic impact, particularly on young people, interestingly enough. And he said to me, Aaron, why do you want to measure the number of new food insecure? Nobody cares about the data. That isn't how policy is made. You're naive in other words. And so when we look at government policy, it's been really driven without any data. We don't have any new data on food insecurity in Israel. The last time a survey was done was 2016. And so it makes it very easy to distribute money any way you want because you're not doing it on the basis of evidence. And I think it's the role of scientists and academics to say, this is what we need to measure. Here's how we measure it and we should go out and do it, provide the data that the policymakers argue. That's why food insecurity came into being. Food insecurity was a word that replaced hunger in parlance. It exists when all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food, which meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. And food insecurity is the absence of these conditions. That was a formulation that was produced by the FAO in Rome because the United Nations have been talking about eradicating hunger and the United States at one of the world food conferences said, yes, that's true, but that's aspirational. It doesn't actually have any binding um, requirements on governments. The US wasn't the only one to object to having a legal framework that an international law would require the eradication of hunger. But we still obviously want to do that. In order to create this term, they created a questionnaire in the USDA that looked at whether um, 18 questions that try to map how serious people's need is. You start with light questions, like we were worried that food would run out. And if you go down the list, you get to more and more severe conditions that people answer in the affirmative to, like we were hungry but did not eat, or we didn't eat for a whole day over the past three or more months, and you can add a score that tells you whether or not people are food secure or insecure. And it used to be that the term was hunger, um, but that changed to food insecurity, high, marginal, and low, um, because uh, in the George Bush administration, um, there was food insecurity with hunger in Texas. He was from Texas and didn't really want that in the terminology. So the tools to measure food security have remained the same, but the terminology has changed. In Israel, you have to ask, like the United States, we've got lots of food. We've got excellent agriculture. I'm at a faculty of agriculture. We have some of the best technology in the world. So what's the problem? Food prices and cost of living. If you look at what it would cost an Israeli to buy the healthy food basket recommended by the Ministry of Health, those in the lowest quintile of income would have to spend nearly two thirds of their salary, nearly two thirds of their income on food. What they send, spend in practice is 42%. So there's a 25% expenditure gap and that results in health disparities because what they're throwing out are the healthy fruits, vegetables, fresh produce um, that are nutrient rich and energy dense. And instead of that, they're eating high energy, low nutritional value fats and carbs. And in fact, if we look at those 2016 data, nearly a fifth of Israelis, similar to the quintile, lowest quintile of the population, are food insecure, and a quarter of Israelis' children. We've done research on the food banks in Israel and their response, and we found 
that among food bank recipients, the rates of disease, metabolic disease, are three to four times those in the regular population. We've also found that food banks that provide fruits and vegetables, even though they don't give enough for families to eat, the little bit that they supplement affects how people make their food choices and seems to increase the overall quality of the diet by influencing the way in which they use their money. Having said that, whether or not food banks are healthy or not is still a big policy issue. And just now in the New York Times, there's talk of the food banks in the United States. This is from April 9th, how COVID turned food pantries into mini Costco's. There's been a huge growth of these food banks and in order to provide food to millions of people, they've begun to operate like small businesses with logistics and forklifts and storage and warehouses. Do we really wanna be investing our charitable funds in that? Or is that something which should be solved at a greater level? Now in Israel, we have government policy, which ostensibly says we're going to provide money to food banks, which will help distribute that through a whole network of small food pantries. And we're gonna manage that and provide funding. But in fact, if you look at the budgets, there are 1,748, sorry, 1,745 NGOs that distribute food in Israel today, of whom 190 are dedicated to food. The government provides about 52 million shekel in direct food aid and the philanthropic sector, and, and of that 500, sorry, uh, yes, 52 million shekel in direct food aid. And of that, the philanthropic sector brings in an annual turnover, 2 billion shekel. In other words, the government is pending between two to 10% of the direct support for food aid. If you looked at a loaf of bread, this is what it would look like. And that was a, a slide that I brought for a testimony in a, a Knesset parliamentary hearing on this issue. Um, I'm going to skip in the interests of time um, a, a whole variety of, of slides. I, I'll just say that the issue today is that if we have to look at this at a global level, um, we need to continually produce more food and the population is growing and we may not be able to do that over the next period of time. So agriculture research is going to be very important. But the balance of our diet is such that production of meat um, and the land use is distributed in a way which is not sustainable. And so there have been commissions that say that we need to move to a plant-based diet in order to improve our health and improve planetary health. When you look at what that diet costs, that issue of price in Israel is not unique. All around the world, a healthy diet costs roughly five to six times what an energy sufficient diet is. That is, you have enough calories to survive, but you're not going to be healthy on that diet. So we have a problem with the food system generally, and that brings us back to that perspective of food systems. During COVID, because of the pressures of the pandemic, the food price in index internationally has gone up to levels that haven't been seen for the years since um, the uh, 2007 and 2008 um, price increases and recession. And that has impact on political stability. It also has impact on what people eat at the macroeconomic level. These are data showing the change in food imports in Israel during the pandemic. And I won't go over the graph in detail, but what it shows is on the one hand, people were locked at home, they imported more food and they ate more. Food prices went up. And so what they ate, even at a national level, were more fats and carbohydrates and less fresh produce. And in other words, the national diet shifted much as individual diets shift to a poor health diet um, under conditions of stress. All of this requires real policy issues. Now, the people who legislated the food label policy, Litzman, um, the director general of the uh, Ministry of Health, Bar Simantov, Itamar Grotto, who was the deputy minister of health, um, Eli Gordon, who was the head of the food services, Rivka Sheffer, who was the director of public health services, all of them have changed over during Corona, other than um, a really fabulous uh, civil servant, Professor Renit Enveld, who's been heading the drive as a person who determines nutrition policy in the ministry. All of these people have changed over during Corona, and so we need to educate the Ministry of Health again, we need to educate the public again, we need to be involved in the process 
of trying to support policy and yet to do it on the basis of data and evidence to make sure that what is recommended actually has the intended effect. Um, we know that there have been uh, challenges um, with um, trust in science. We see that um, evidence has become very partisan and it's very important to figure out how we play our hand as scientists and our role um, and how the institutions that we represent, universities like the Hebrew University, our nutrition school, our faculty of agriculture, food and environment, um, take a role to provide the objective, trustworthy and cutting edge evidence in order to provide the solutions for these um, tremendous human problems. Um, so I will leave you with that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. That honestly was what a, a fascinating conversation. Um, really, really enlightening and, and very complex. Um, and I think you, you did a fabulous job, you know, talking about all the different aspects of that. We're now gonna open up um, the floor for questions. If you have a question, please use the chat box and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, we did have one that came in earlier, which I think you touched on a little bit, um, asking to address you know, how ethics and morals, um, as well as environmental issues should enter into food discussion. Well, I, I think that there are, um, that they're necessary. They have to be part of the uh, discussion in the policy arena. And I think it's helpful to have data that support our judgments over which policy outcomes we prefer. The value judgments, I have no particular um, advantage over anyone else on whether I prefer one you know, equity over um, you know, equality over, uh, say, um, uh, opportunity and autonomy. So there are certain issues which are always going to come into conflict in the, in the, in the policy arena in terms of values. Um, but we have to ask the question, not only on the fairness side of the equation, but on the efficiency and efficacy side of the equation, are we able to define the measures to determine if the policy is effective? Are we able to um, see whether or not we're achieving those goals and to say objectively whether we are or not? Now, scientists tend to be hesitant. I'm not giving you a clear answer here because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be precise. And that doesn't always fly well in the policy arena. And like my colleague, Dovchil Nikhovsky, he wasn't simply being cynical. He was saying, look, the importance of data are, they carry less weight than other kinds of considerations. Politicians wanna know now what the bottom line is in order to act, even if they're acting on good faith in our interests without uh, having to deal with the issue of, are they going to be biased? Are they beholden to other kinds of uh, commercial and financial interests? So I try not to be cynical about these choices. I try to be realistic. It is to be aware that there are really powerful interests that we have to oppose in order to provide and prioritize the goal of public health and well-being. That has to be weighed against other aspirations. For example, in food security, if I want to have cheap food, theoretically, I could import my food and that would come at the expense of Israeli farmers. If I want the farmers to have a livelihood and produce enough fruits and vegetables, I want high prices to encourage them. At the same time, that's going to impact other parts of the population who don't have money. So there are issues that are going to be in um, tension with each other inevitably. And one doesn't have to be a cynic to say, well, it's all a matter of power. Power plays a role here. And scientists have a role, have a job, and trying to um, analyze that and make sure that to the best of our abilities, we're looking at things um, from a, a, a even playing field. We're judging this on the basis of evidence and not simply on the basis of our uh, gut feelings. Understood. Well, we have several people who um, are relaying how wonderful and excellent um, the presentation was. Um, and Michelle actually wants to know, is there a way to take a class with you or to learn more from you? Uh, 
Oh boy. Um, well, I, I, I'm, you know, these days we're giving our classes a hybrid. I'm running a, a do you, if you speak Hebrew, I could uh, let you audit uh, my um, policy course. Um, I'd be, you know, if, if there's only a single individual, um, you can write me through Miriam and we'll see what we can do. Um, I, as I said, you know, this was not my forte. I was doing neuroscience uh, up until recently and I'm, I'm gradually entering into this field. Um, but maybe it's an idea to create an online MOOC. And uh, other than that, I'd be happy to provide you with references. So <laughs> there's a lot of good information out there to read publicly available that uh, has, has I've used to educate myself. Great, thank you for that. Um, Dr. Miles Krieger um, asked if you could address a syntax to make healthy food less expensive versus unhealthy. Uh, yes. I, I think we should, uh, you know, personally, I think taxes are a good idea. Um, the free market has market failures. The idea that the free market is simply going to produce the best possible outcome um, on all fronts, all dimensions, price and health, um, it simply doesn't work. It, it, the evidence doesn't support that. And if we're concerned with promoting health, we need to create incentives, disincentives, and other kinds of regulations in order to um, drive the market in the direction that will improve our health. And as I said, we have an enormous health crisis. We are not capable of choosing freely when what you see on the shelf is placed by major corporate interests who control um, food placement and food delivery in that availability and supply side of the um, food uh, uh, system. So I, I'm very much in favor of a food tax. We're um, working on um, that uh, policy drive in Israel. Um, I'm, I'm involved with that as a member of the Israel Public Health Physician Association and as a member of Hebrew U Nutrition School. Um, it's, it's, I think it's going to be crucial. On the other hand, part of our involvement is to review the literature from what works around the world and to try to generate data on what our situation is here, economic data, so that we can go and, um, and, and uh, support the decision makers in opposing, in, in finding the best possible policy solution and opposing uh, forces that would um, diminish uh, health outcomes versus the economic interests. Got it. I think in the interest of time, we do have a few more questions, um, but um, if people would like them answered, I, I can uh, forward them along to the professor um, and get them answered individually. Uh, thank you again. This was really fascinating. The, this talk is being recorded. I will share a link afterwards, um, and I honestly highly recommend that you share it widely with as many people as possible because it was really, really fascinating. And, and something that clearly affects all of us no matter where we live. Um, so, oh, yes, go ahead. I, I just want to say I'm sorry if I spoke at, at, at too long and, and there wasn't enough time for questions. If you would uh, download the chat, uh, Miriam, if you can save yes. the chat, then I will try to um, find time over the next couple of days um, to uh, provide responses and share them with you. Absolutely. Um, you have my email. I'd be glad to uh, address people's questions if, if you're interested. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you again, uh, again for really just a, a remarkable presentation on a on a really complex topic. Um, and again, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we hope uh, you enjoyed it as, as much as I did. I, I think I think based on the comments, the answer is is a resounding yes. Uh, Professor, again, thank you so much. Um, we will be back in the fall with Torch Talks, but in the meantime, there will be other great uh, content coming from American Friends and the Hebrew University. Thank you again, and we hope to see you at an upcoming event soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.